everyone, and welcome back to Command Stack. I'm Ken. I'm Garrett. And I'm Ryan. And John has been captured by Ewoks. We've got a uh, party of scout troopers out trying to pick him up. Uh, so hopefully he'll be back at some point, maybe around the time Rapid Reinforcements 3 comes out. Because uh, you know how Ewoks are, guys. They eat. Don't they eat the stormtroopers? They do eat Done. the stormtroopers. He's cooked. Yeah, well, so I get... Yeah. Let, let's hope John got away with something. Maybe uh, maybe C-3PO is helping him out. What do you guys think? I don't know. I don't he know walks, if he's going to like droids. He walks out in Legion now. Uh, They're out yeah. in pre-release or something. I'm looking. Uh, where's looking my, where's my Ewok anything. officer upgrade card? <laughs> For Armada? Yeah, where's it at? Where's Wicket? Ah, man, what would that do? Get a free biscuit? I don't know. Logjam and Architons. <laughs> They don't really strike me as a spacefaring civilization. But I don't maybe. think so. I've seen both indoor movies, so I am an expert. <laughs> <laughs> oh, the uh, Caravan and Courage and uh, yeah. Battle for Endor? Yep. Uh, there's some fun <laughs> stuff from my youth. If, 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 if you ever like think you've seen a bad Star Wars show, I've got recommendations. <laughs> yeah, but Battle uh, for Endor is where the Night Sisters originated. I Maybe, yeah. like It's like Space Witches. Those were yeah. such weird... Weird movies. Uh, but anyways, everybody, let's talk about some news. Yeah, um, we don't have it. a lot of news. Um, we didn't get anything special on May the 4th. What we thought we were going to get, we got a lot here. Rapid Reinforcements 2 came out like a couple weeks ago, um, which was really surprising. Again, they really are good at just dropping these things out of nowhere. Um, we thought we'd get Store Champ kits by now because the season for Worlds 2024 is supposed to start on May 4th. Um, X-Wing and Legion have their kits. Uh, stores cannot order Armada kits yet. Uh, we don't have any official information on when those will become available. Uh, we do know that they're imminent, so just keep a lookout. Yeah, um, it's just I just wanted to say something. It's kind of a bummer because, like, you see, you you look at the other uh, other systems, and there are they got they're already having their store champs, right? They're they're planning them out, and uh, the spaces and the times are filling up for when these tournaments can be held. Um, so hopefully there's no tournament crunch kind of thing. There's only so many Saturdays to get these in. So hopefully, right. So I'm checking, checking every week, um, with my stores to see if it's available. Uh, so far, nothing, um, huge bummer. There's no Gen Con Armada. Uh, and I don't think this is any large conspiracy thing. I think it really comes down to, there's no buddy there to organize Armada at Gen Con. Um, I know a lot of these events are ran by local communities or people who have relationships with the tournaments like Gen Con. Uh, and I, there was a missing link there where nobody stepped up for Armada and it just fell off the roster. Um, but of course that doesn't mean it's not going to be at Nova, which we already know, um, another close tournament, um, geographically and time-wise. Uh, so kind of a bummer. Uh, so if you're planning to go to Gen Con for Armada, you might get a pickup game, but there's no official events happening. Uh, and that comes back to our store champ thing. Uh, nothing to work off of. Uh, so that's kind of, that's, uh, I mean, really, it's just a bummer. Um, and then Ryan here is going to talk about the 800 points sector fleets from Adepticon. We wanted to circle back and make sure we recognized how cool those fleets were and who the winners of the sector fleet tournament was. Yeah, so um, there's there's two different tournaments, uh, well, larger format tournaments from Worlds, and, and I think it's cool. Like you still won a Worlds event, um, that doesn't happen, so we want to recognize the the fleets and the and the people who played in them. So the first one was a 600 point team tournament. So you know each each team gets 300, uh, or each person in the team gets 300 points, and so that was Broba Fett and Cylindrical Bobcat who. I have played Cylindrical Bobcat many times online, and I did not realize he was at Adepticon. I would have said hi uh, with my with my broken voice. But uh, so Broba Fett's fleet was a Radis fleet with a Star Cruiser loaded out to bear with Mon Karen, XI-7, Kaken and Sholin, pretty standard stuff. Uh, he was dropping from a CR-90 uh, that featured Janus Light, Ashoka Tano, and that's where Radis was. And then he had a GR-75, with Ezra and Comsnet, and then a light fighter screen of Shara, Dagger, Dagger Squadron, which is cool to see. 
Green Squadron and three Z95s. And then Cylindrical Bobcat was running Agate uh, on an, an assault frigate with flight controllers, expanded hangar bay, and then uh, Nebulon B escort frigate with Yavaris and flight commander, backed up by GR-75 with Wedge, Bomber Command Center, and Reserve Hangar Deck. And then he had a nasty squad, nasty squad ball of Luke, Janors, 10 Num, two B-Wings, and an X-Wing. Uh, and that came in at 598 points. Um, I think they both in their fleets made good use of the fact that they got kind of heightened value for their commanders at 300 points. Cause we always kind of think like, Oh, agate at 800 points is not, not any good. Right. Cause she only gets her one, one token at 800 points. But, but if you get her at 300 points, that even makes her, uh, you know, a little bit stronger and, and radis. Uh, as well, so congratulations to Bobcat or Boba Fett and Cylindrical Bobcat on winning uh, a world that the 600 point world tournament. So that's pretty cool. What do you guys think of 600 points? I personally like it, uh, but especially when you do something like this where you combine two 300 point fleets, yeah. Uh, so I, I think I said this like maybe it was like a whole year ago, or maybe eight months, but I think 600 points, uh, I found it more fun, um, than 400 points. Uh, flexibility of fleets you can use upgrade cars are usually outrageously expensive all of a sudden you can use because you have extra points to dip into um not as common to find people who play 600 points in my place but uh i have a lot of competitive people around me who want to play 400 but um yeah 600 points i'm a huge proponent if you haven't played it do it 600 and up 800 yeah well, and that's it's part of like why I wanted to kind of recognize this because it's like if that's your jam, six hundred points, like let's let's give a little prestige to winning this tournament. It's a cool thing. So, you know, it's a lot more to think about too, I and mean, because you don't have just the small set of four hundred points, you've you've got a fifty percent more. That's a lot more activations, a lot more thinking, a lot yeah. more strategy. Right, and you're building your own list. There's not a lot of six hundred point templates out there. You're yeah. just copy and pasting from the last worlds. So does that mean I have to go down to Kentucky and uh, Garrett, you and I are going to play a couple 600 point games? I'll meet you in the middle. All right. At Gen Con. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, hurts bad. Uh, too soon. Too soon. Um, all right. So let's let's then go to the 800 point. So this was the Sector Fleet 800 point tournament. Uh, Nick LaTrenta um, was running Imperials with Moff Gergerod. Um, this was a, kind of a solo tournament. Um, you're playing all 800 points. Uh, so he had, in as you do in an 800-point tournament, you bring in an SSD. So he had the Assault Prototype, which was interesting, um, with Jerry, Brunson, Damage Control Officer, Expert Shield Tech, Gunnery Teams, Ravager, XI-7s. You know, you know, everyone knows the drill there. Loaded out to bail. Um, then Interdictor with uh, Projection Experts, Targeting Scrambler, Grav Shift Reroute, and the Interdictor uh, title. Um, two uh, Gazantes, one with Comsnet, one's with a pair crews and ha- a Hondo, and then he had an Onager test bed with Ozil, which, which was kind of kind of interesting in an 800 point game to get the get the Onager up front with Cataclysm, you know, doing the turn one Onager Cataclysm thing uh, with Sensor Team and and Veteran Gunners, and then he had a full Squadron Ball, uh, all 172 points, uh, Morna, Bosk, Darth Vader, Tell two fire sprays and two decimators which is like a super fun squad ball to play and that came in at, at 798 points so a lot Man. of a lot of beef on those rogues uh yeah that's a uh, i can see why you won bringing the assault prototype is smart all the all the space for activities that's a lot of that's like three different lists in one list it's amazing that's so, why I mean, that's why sector fleet stuff so fun right huh. you're doing all those different shenanigans he just took all the shenanigans of the Empire and put it in one spot. I, I just think it's cool that for 335 points, he brought a fully decked out Superstar Destroyer versus spending, you know, like 400 to just get the frame for the for the Executor. Yeah. yeah. Although the Executor is nasty, I'll say that. <laughs> oh, yes, it is. It's a different beast. I, personal opinion is that is the way a Superstar Destroyer should feel. Yeah, definitely. So congrats, congrats to Nick. I will say on this on this format, I think it's too big. 
um, without it being in monster truck format. Um, I, I really think it squad should be limited to like a hundred points. And then the rest of the shipbuilding is just monster trucks, which is basically if you want to bring a large, if you want to bring a small ship, you have to bring a large and that's, that's just generally the kind of the basic rules. And I, and I like to see that format kind of become popularized. Some of the feedback from this tournament was, I just took too long and you get it because you have there, you know, there's some fleets out there with 10, 12 activations and you just can't finish that in time. So I think for the bigger, bigger fleets, monster truck kind of needs to be the standard uh, for the big, big tournaments. I think that's fair. Forced fleet variety too. It makes it more realistic. Yeah, and you're showing you're showing off, right? You, you right. have like showing off to everyone there. You have four ISDs on, like on the table. How cool would that be? Right. And then with all with seventh fleet or something. I don't know. Yeah, that's it. Next time I do eight hundred points, I am one hundred percent going to bring uh, a superstar destroyer, ISDs, and nothing else. Yeah. Maybe yeah. some TIE Fighter Squadrons, just the generic ones to fill bring it out. Bring Jonas. Just bring one Jonas just <laughs> just for those accuracies. With the escorts. Uh, but yeah, well, uh, again, congrats to Nick. And uh, what were the other winners? I'm sorry. Uh, Broba Fett and Broba. Cylindrical Bobcat. Yeah, huge congrats, you guys. Um, and, and now we're going to move into the meat of the podcast, talking about Rapid Reinforcements 2 post-clarifications. <laughs> There, there's a lot to talk about, a lot to unpack. I will say this going, uh, starting out, it's really cool. We got some new cards. Uh, they were teased at Adepticon. Uh, John and I were kind of talking about it, you know, in the interim before they they dropped because we knew they were coming. We just didn't know when. Um, so <laughs> by random chance, I sent an email out to uh, Atomic Mass Games asking them, hey, if you're going to submit these, could we maybe get a, a a quick preview so that we can do a battle report? And then literally like that day they were dropped. And I'm like, well, I guess there's our preview. <laughs> so, uh, like I said, once again, we wished things into existence. So you're welcome, everybody. Uh, and, and and I'm sorry, depending. So. <laughs> yeah. yeah um, we, got, we got new content. It's we good, did. Yeah. Good day. You know? Upgrade cards and squadrons. So upgrade I think we said this last time. With commanders uh, in, right. in upgrade cards, which is unique. Uh, and kind of cool. Uh, but I think we should talk about the squadrons first. What do you guys think? All right, let's do it. Let's do it. Who wants to start with Matchstick? You seemed excited about him. Ken, let's go. Matchstick. All right. Time. Uh, so let's go through his card. Uh, he's on a Y-Wing. Uh, while you are unengaged, friendly squadrons with Bomber at distance one will gain Rogue. Cool. Uh, it has Bomber and Heavy. So best thing to describe Matchstick is you have a range one bubble where any of your bomber squadrons in their sets, arcs and more Y-wings, gain rogue while you're within it. So wherever matchstick is, you can move into matchstick's bubble, and then you can fire, or you can fire and then move out. What you can't do is start there, move out, and then you've lost rogue because you're no longer within distance one of matchstick. Mm -hmm. So he's kind of a cool little centerpiece where you move him where he needs to go, and as long as he's unengaged, you get to do a little bit more attacking. But it's pretty easy to shoot down if you can get something, engage matchstick, and then that eliminates a lot of that rogue capability. Uh, I think a really cool addition, it gives you some options with a lot of fighter squads uh, in terms of bombing runs with Republic. I think this is one area that they need a little bit of help. Uh, and we did have, uh, looking at it, because um, the, the ability is functional, even during deployment, you can use hyperspace rings and throw them all over the place uh, and whatnot. So, I agree. Yeah, I think. 14, 14 I'm sorry. Right? Yeah, go ahead, Garrett. I was just going to say, I think it's like, I know we're going to talk about balance a lot um, in this podcast, but I think Matchstick is like perfectly balanced. Uh, I think the whole unengaged part makes his card work wonderfully on the table because you, as an enemy player, Know what you have to do to stop his shenanigans. It's really quite clear. You can stop it. Um, and then his abilities are really cut and clear. Distance one, somebody could, they gain rogue and they and they're and they're rogue. And that's it. Um I don't know. I just it's it's clean. Um I also wanted to ask, what do you guys think the artwork in the background is? I didn't look at this before. Are those purgles behind the Y Wing? I think I've looked at this big. Always good to look at the artwork here. Now you're uh, making me look. Yeah, sorry. I think it's pearl. It's totally off topic. But anyways, 
Uh, yeah, no, I think it's great. Um, and I think it encourages uh, maybe not some non-Salvo Anakin builds because uh, it's another competitive uh, bomber list for the Republic. But, but, uh, I'm sorry, Ryan, what do you think? You know, I um, I agree with you. It's, it's just really neat little card um that is just so interesting to to do really kind of unique things with it it's it's they didn't just give rogue out like kind of generally you like you they're, they're making you kind of work for it a little bit yeah um which is cool like you can land on a rock right like if your ship fl- flies near a rock you're gonna you're gonna be in a lot of trouble now um and you gotta be looking at this artwork now I don't, I don't. And it's it's the know. only way to get rogue is the Republic. Uh, this is it, right. and it's only for bombers. And so I don't. Know, it's just it's just a fun card. Uh, ten out of ten. Go card ahead. on the on the table. So speaking of art, I noticed that all of these cards are also brand new art. Uh, and yeah. with this grouping, they've all added the artist's name on it. I think that's really cool that we got some new art. So they're clearly putting some level of investment into Armada. Uh, 14 points versus 10 for a Y-Wing. Not a lot more, but like Garrett, like you said, you know exactly what you need to do to shut them down. Yeah. And it's double brace. I don't know. It's just, I would trade off, uh, who is it? Uh, at a kickback, I think, is the one that doesn't absorb damage. Like, give it a kickback. Take this guy. Keep Axe. Um, and so I, got a, I got a thought on him. And this is this is mainly, might be heretical. Given what else, how good you know Anakin? <laughs> but I think pairing Matchstick with Yannikin, you know the Y wing, yeah. could be really good. You know this this double die bomber, uh, Rogue just kind of goes over the place and just eats ships. I think I think could be really cool. I think so too. <laughs> I like that idea. I'm going to try that. Who do we got next? Watts Hanbor, our Belbelub. 22 Starfighter. Um, so yeah, so this is Watan Boer. He adds escort to the CIS. Um, only escort. Uh, he's carrying a heavy load on his shoulders here. Uh, he's got relay and screen uh, and a brace evade, which some people are like, ah, it's not very good, but uh, he's got screen. So you're not bringing a CIS list with less than like 10 squadrons. So <laughs> if you're going to use this tactic, so he's going to, he's going to get all his, his dodge three, um, a brace, an evade. I. It's a tough one because obviously his officer, you can argue, is better in a tier list. But uh, if you want to fly CIS squadrons, uh, this is a way to really make it work a little bit more to your advantage because um, he can soak up like two to three turns of damage uh, before he goes down, potentially. If you figure right. you partner him with some squadrons, your squadrons should be able to take down one ace a turn while their aces are trying to take down Wat Tambor. That's I right. Agree with that. Cheap vultures are even like you could you could shell out the cash for them tri fighters. Uh, I, I just you know, and, and this you know you do a lot Watt, of damage in one turn. Wat doesn't have a special ability, right? Like he nope. doesn't have any special keyword. It's just these these three ability, you know, these three keywords, I guess all kind of working together to make something cool, mainly escort and screen. Yep. Uh, it's that combination that unlocks Watt. Um, it really unlocks all sorts of fighter builds. We haven't seen what people are going to come up with yet, um, you know, on a, on a tournament level, but it's that, it's that forcing you to attack Watt, but then getting the three rerolls with screen uh, that that's going to be awesome. Yes. Uh, and I, I, the best thing about screen is like, it doesn't matter if the, they get the, both their perfect two accuracies. You're like, nah, nah, nah. Reroll all three dice. Uh, well, I don't yeah. think you could reroll accuracies, screen. right? What's up with screen? You can't reroll accuracies, huh? Well, I meant like if somebody's throwing like five blue dice at you, right? Okay. They get two accuracies and three damage. You're like, nah, nah, nah. Reroll this three damage. And gotcha, you gotcha. potentially get a couple more accuracies and just take one on the nose. And then you can't add to the, the screen. Right. Gotcha, gotcha. Uh, yeah. So I don't know. It's a good, another, I would say another 10 out of 10 addition, right? Like uh, oh, 20 absolutely. points is expensive, but like he's going to be tanking. Like you're going to be saving two to three vultures a turn. 
with this. You really guy. didn't see, and the Belbo Lab is such a cool model too. I think uh, you don't really see it on the table. And right. you know, I've I've flown against Watt, um, and it was good. It was really it was really annoying uh, to take down, but it was kind of what they needed. What's Very interesting? Dramatic. What's interesting about Watt Tambor is you're given a strategic choice while building. Do you want them to basically preserve your fighters, or do you want him to preserve your ships? Because in either case, he's either helping your one ship that he's on, and you, you go up against a Watt Tambor ship, and it, it's hard to take him down when you can pull that. Here's 10 engineering points that magically showed up. Uh, it's not too dissimilar on the squadron build for his uh, Belba Lab. So I don't know. I, I kind of like thematically exactly what they did, and this seems to work. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, how often did we see, like, all right, the CIS fighter builds were like five vultures? And you're like, okay, like, now they really get to to open it up a little bit, ditch up maybe ditch a hard sell, get you know six more squads or something. Maybe we'll see hyenas you know back on the table a bunch. Um, I feel like we just didn't see them too much. So I, I, lots amazing. Yep, another home run. And Ryan, which two squadron more. do you want to talk about? Uh, the one I'm most interested that I I have put in my uh, my competitive builds is Fen Rao. Um, gauntlet fighter. I had to, uh, and I found this out on the last episode that we had that that they only released the gauntlet fighter and the chimera. Yep. So I I didn't have a chimera, so I went and, and paid fifty sixty dollars for for a gauntlet fighter uh, this two weeks ago. Mission and, accomplished, AMG. Yeah, AMG did it. They got me. Uh, I was like, this is going in my build. I think it's really good. Uh, so you know. Speed four, seven hull, one brace. Interesting. Um, anti squad is two blue, one one red, um, and then the uh, anti ship is kind of the, is the Han Solo special of one blue, one black, non bomber. It's his ability though that is uh, kind of sets him apart. He does have escort, which is interesting um, as well. Don't don't forget that and assault. But uh, basically, when he is activated by a squad command. Um, once it's resolved and once he is done, he can to choose two non-unique squadrons at distance one, and they may activate um, as if they were. So basically, w- one squad token can activate three fighters, theoretically. Um, it's cool because you get um, that huge boost and, and burst, I guess, kind of like a like a burst. Um, but it's also playing up non-uniques. So you're looking at A-wings or X-wings. Uh, maybe in the right environment, some B wings can can get activated. I don't see it being used too much with Y wings, um, but you know, even YT twenty four hundreds or VCXs uh, are going to be really cool to use with him. Um, he's speed four, so he can jump around all, all over the board to kind of use this ability. Um, and and the key is you know, you have to be at distance one to to activate those squads. So he is he's going in my Rebel squad builds. Um, I, I like him a lot. The anti-squad is not good. You know, I, I'll say that. Um, you know, two blues and one red is is just not very good. But hopefully you can make up for that with, like, activating two X-Wings or something. I was going to say, I think the biggest thing, like, you farm with ADAR, right? So one GR-75 <laughs> is doing serious work. I and don't then... fly ADAR, so I, I wouldn't. You don't? I don't. No I don't ADAR? I have, oh, my I have, gosh. I have you can double tap FINRA, and then he, do- he activates four squad. <laughs> Uh, see, Ryan does not fly with Adar, and he always has Han Solo. So, I mean, you got to remember that. It's, yeah, it's unconventional. It is okay. expensive to front Fen Rao and Han Solo in a build. I'll tell you, that. that's 50 <laughs> points well spent, but my goodness. <laughs> yeah. He is 24 points, so he's not cheap. No. He's not cheap. I don't know. That's you guys are tough one to take down. down. Tough one to take down. No, I, I think this is kind of a neat design, and it, it really opens up the door for more generics on the Rebel side. Uh, and and it, it it gives you another way to push some extra squadrons uh, for a smaller build. Uh, and then you can kind of get things positioned a little bit quicker. Uh, and I, I think that's kind of neat. I, I think he's going to be really good with, with what's in the back of the artwork there is the A-wing. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think you can, you can jump the A-wings, especially if you're a first player, jump the A-wings in on the rogue phase uh, the turn before. Um, and then jump Fen Rao in there with an activation. Then you, and then you're throwing what nine dice? Um, mm-hmm. not, not too bad. And you then you do with Commander Sato, and then you're throwing black dice at range. 
Yeah. Well, I mean, Sato with the assault might might be decent. I don't I don't yeah. know. Could be fun to see. Yep. So I think I think we all kind of think great addition. Yeah. Interesting card. Yep. Uh, good Next for business is- because you have to spend sixty dollars to play them. So well, yeah, it's, it's- I don't mind. I I you got to make money. I understand that. So I painted yeah, them up. Too. I enjoy painting them. Get two with the Chimera, right? So you know, yeah. you can have one Imperial one and Fen Rao. So that's true. I have a nice New Orleans, New Orleans Saints black and gold color scheme that I painted them in. Looks I'm... great. Can't wait to put them on the table and beat Garrett with them. So. Looks like bringing this guy behind me. <laughs> All right, what, what's uh, my squad? Volt Last Scares. squad. Volt Scares. Got him. You want me to take him? All yeah. Right. So TIE Interceptor, Vault Scarus, of course, from Star Wars Rebels. Uh, during the squadron phase, you cannot make non-counter attacks. So that really kind of limits what he can do uh, at the during the squadron phase, but still perfectly fine if you activate him with the squadron command. Uh, counter four, which is humongous. Uh, and then a swarm. So when you start realizing that you can add, uh, what is it, uh, fighter control teams, not fighter uh, controls, what's the other one uh, that adds the die? Owl Runner. Howl runner flight, flight controllers flight controllers yeah um and uh i know there's another way to add in extra dice but you, you should be able to theoretically throw six seven dice uh at times to you know for counter which is incredible yeah so you can get to a high counter with gore um go, i think inspector goron or something there and it is are. inspector goron yeah uh and denver yeah. um you, you've got you've got some neat options here to throw lots of dice uh, for counters, uh, especially when you're, uh, it's a defensive move, right? So, I mean, at some point you have to take out Scaris. Um, he's going to go right in the middle of the build. He's throwing extra dice. Uh, if you activate him, he's going to hit you with, you know, double blue, double black, which is devastating to most squadrons. Um, not too much against ships, but I don't think that's what Vault Scaris is here to do. Uh, I think he's here to kind of supplement some of your firepower. Now, is he going to really compete up against some of the other aces that you have, like your Jendon Merrick uh, combination? Yeah, probably not. But in certain builds, I think he can do a lot of damage. Uh, I think he'd be see a lot of use in campaign play too. Yeah, um, I think the biggest thing holding him back, right, is he's got to evade instead of a brace. Um, yeah. I think that keeps him from being superstar. I would take him over Sienna if he had a brace. That evade makes him really hard to keep alive. Yeah, uh, that's the thing. At 18 points, that's tough. Yeah. It's a I, neat no. having that counter four plus though. I mean it's a lot, but again, like it's a that's a real risky glass cannon you're bringing in there. That that's the thing though. Do you really okay. want to shoot at Vault Scaris to take him out? Knowing you're going to get at least four dice being chucked back at you. Yeah, you got to bring your chunky, your chunky squadrons after him, right? And then have what? What is it? Janors that eats damage or what for you or something? <laughs> yeah. Um. Uh, but yeah, I don't know. I have yeah. any evade instead of a brace is a real, um, almost deal breaker for me. This is this is kind of always the problem with with imperial squads and interceptors and tie fighters. It's when you don't, you know, do they have a place in a non Sloan build? Um, you know, like this, this has a place in a Sloan build. Yeah. You know, it, it's very good. There are lots of, you can, I, I've been playing around with Vault, Scare, um, Vault, Howl Runner, Dengar, and Suntir Fell. So if, you know, if you aren't attacking Vault, you know, you got to attack Suntir, who's throwing four counter back at you. Um, but then you still have Howl Runner, who's, who's safe and going to add an extra dice in as well. So, you know, if, but outside of Sloan, it's kind of, what what do you what do you do with these high priced aces uh, to get how do you get value against them and and it's difficult it's a difficult call yeah probably my least favorite squadron obviously out of the four by far my least favorite but uh, still good still play uh, which is good won't go in the box of shame yeah is he taking his helmet on or is he taking his helmet off in the artwork because now Garrett's got me thinking about all the artwork. To me, it looks like he's get, he's 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 sweating. He's done. He's getting out. So he's about to hit the showers. Yeah, too much counter. Like to it's all worn out. The refresher. I'm sorry. The refresher. <laughs> he's already gone out of his way. Destroyed a bunch of things with his counter, and he's he's done for the day. Right. 
That's right. Yeah. He gained his He's veteran back. token. Um, but yeah, uh, so let's talk about the two officer cards. Um, who wants to tackle, which I already kind of have, the infamous Governor Price returns. Go for have it. We Gary. talked about price though. Like I don't. I think a little bit. Um, I mean, ba- I mean, it's really simple. You know, she's really cut clean here. You know, once per activation, uh, when you're shooting a ship, you spend the shield dial from the zone you're attacking from, and you get to change one of your die to any result you want. Um, obviously, everyone's like, "Oh, it's gonna be awful on the onager." And yeah, I mean, it's true. But it also makes a lot of other imperial ships um, a lot more advantageous. Uh, everyone's talked about it. SSD, um, interdictors. Uh, I mean, you can put it on, uh, what's the, oh man, I'm blanking on the ship. I wanted to put it on now. Uh, it looks I've like lost I've lost it. I've lost it. Um, well, but, anyway, but, but yeah, I mean, anywhere you want to use like those really cool ion cannon, um, upgrades, right. I mean, you're guaranteed the result you want. Um, if you want to combine this with, you know, sensor team or screed. Right, that's a lot of dice fixing. I mean, why bother even rolling the dice? Just put them on the table how you want them, right? <laughs> so, uh, I mean, yeah. But uh, again, it's I think it's a good card. Seven points. Um, and oh, to do slot. the ability, you lose something, right? Your shields. Uh, and later in a game, you know, you could, you could, you know, the difference between winning and losing could be that one shield that you spent to change your die. And if you do that every time, right? I mean, you're just going to soak shields really fast. Like an onager, you know, two turns, you're down from five to three um, before they ever even come at you. So I don't know. What do you guys think? I think it's, I think it's a pretty good card. I, I don't think it's overpowered. I think it adds another toolbox to the empire, which do they need another toolbox to fix dice? Uh, maybe not, but <laughs> it is a good card that people will use. So I think that's also good for the game. Yeah, I think it's properly priced. I think it's very competitive. Um, we'll see it. On, it's it's very good on Onager. That's where I've where I've tested it out. Yeah, um, and I like it. And I just kind of like running naked Onagers, which is just her, and and that's kind of it. Um, very lean, lean Onager. So I I like her. She's good. Um, she's competitive right away. Raiders, Raiders is what I want to put her on. <laughs> to do shenanigans. Uh, but yeah, what do you think, Ken? Any thoughts? I I think again we've kind of talked about this. Uh, you're you're exhausted. You're losing a shield to use your ability. Set a die, whether you need an accuracy or you want, um, you know the a black. You want a uh a black a hit crit, uh, or you want to get that crit on the blue to utilize uh HIEs or whatever it is. You can always get those shields back. You're either burning engineering or you can pick up redundant shields for eight points. There's a, a card that'll come back and get used. It's a lot of points for fixing one die. Sometimes, though, one die is all you need because uh, Governor, Pro- Governor Price effectively eliminates the negative of Solar Corona, as an example, because uh, you could still get that accuracy whether you, you know, need it or not. But... Uh, it's got a lot of competition in the officer slot. And, you know, That's we're, talking, okay. we're talking about uh, onagers. Do you want to have Governor Price to guarantee you the one thing you need, accuracy, crit, whatever? Or do you want the intel officer in there to el- help eliminate a, a token? Um, you got to build choices. Yeah, it, it gives you choices, which is, I think, really cool. And it's good to see Governor Price back. Uh, after being banned for a few years. <laughs> yeah. Second edition of Governor Price. Second edition of Governor Price. Uh, okay. Yeah. That's, that's so. kind of my thought. Uh, all right. Well, then let's talk about Ventress. Well, I'll, Ryan, do you want to take Ventress? I do not. All Dang. right. I'll take, I'll take Ventress. Um, so, Saj Ventress, after you perform an attack targeting a ship that is one or more raid tokens, if the defender suffered one or more damage, you may remove one raid token and one command token from the defender. If you do, gain a matching command token. Now, this has been updated to uh, confirm that you're removing the command token uh, and then you gain that same command token. So effectively, if you've got a, whatever raid and a uh, concentrate fire token, you eliminate the raid and you take the concentrate fire token. 
Now, my view on Asajj, your first thought is why would you want to remove raid tokens and what good is she going to be with separatist squadrons? I don't think Ventress is about removing the raid. Uh, it is more about depriving your opponent of critical tokens when they need them. And if you start looking at a lot of fleets, usually you've got a concentrate fire die or a token sitting there to refresh your spats, or you have an engineering there to refresh uh, ECM or whatever it may be. You take, you get your raid, whether that's from Dooku, probably not TF, likely it's going to be Dooku. Uh, you take it away. So great. They don't get the, the negative part of a raid, but they needed that token. So either they're not prepped for it, in which case it's going to take another turn or two for them to get the token that they need. Or if you hit that ship after it activates and it has its token now for the status phase, you've eliminated it. So I think Asajj is more based on depriving your opponent than really having an impact on, on the raid side of it. That, that's my thought. Yeah, I 100% agree. Um, that's how you got to think about it when you're building your list around it. That's how you got to think about it when you're playing it. Uh, there's so many cards that require, you said it's spats, uh, ECMs, uh, any of the parts or munitions resupply, got to have tokens refresh. Right. Um, and I think uh, she's not as plug and play as like Governor Price, right? You're going to have really finesse uh, your fleet into using her in a way that uh, that works. There's no like distance requirements on her. So that's that's convenient, right? So if you can shoot the ship, you can use a Saj. Yeah. Um, so combine her with BT rocket troopers or rocket droid troopers or whatever there are, and then a Dooku and uh yeah, you can really take away those tokens. I think it's big on anti spat fleets, right? Because taking away those stupid confire tokens is critical to ruining how much damage those vendors can put out. Uh but yeah, That's firepower. Forget it, you know, not oh yeah. Yeah, there's another good one. So many. Uh but yeah, four points, super cheap. Mm -hmm. Uh yeah, I mean, and you don't get you don't have to put her on, you know, your most important ship, right? Put her on a hard cell. You know, you've got long range at the front of the hard cell, and it can its job is just to there to do token denial, uh, and then you don't lose, you know, your what your precious Wat Tambor on your uh, Munificent or Providence, right? So, yeah, Slap um, on the Gazanti. Uh, yeah, exactly. Um, so yeah, I I gotta say, I'm gonna say nine out of ten. <laughs> Uh, rating for me on a Saz Ventures. Difficult to use, but will be really interesting at a high level. I think if, if really competitive players use her, I think there's some cool stuff that can happen at a tournament where you ruin somebody's flow. Because like if you if you ruin somebody's, you know, what is it, Rube Goldberg machine or whatever token stuff going on, I mean, you could just train wreck a whole, uh. whole fleet, right? They miss one turn of tokens and then it, the timing's all off. Yeah, so I I've, I've kind of talked about this concept in Armada of undeniability and like, she's got that, you know, like she's going to take your token, you know, and you're not gonna be able to do anything to prevent that. And, and, and those kinds of cards historically in Armada, undeniable, you know, cards that have undeniability are very strong. You know, you have no agency kind of, kind of type of thing, you know, like a boarding trooper card or something like that. And that's what she does of all the, of, of, of these eight cards that we got, she's the one I don't know what to do with <laughs> more than any of them. I just don't know. I haven't, I haven't gotten her on the table yet. I don't know how she's going to flow. She's a really interesting puzzle to figure out. Um, but I'd like, you know, I, I find when I build separatist fleets, I go a lot, a lot of times without an officer on a hard sell or something like that. And I could see finding four points and it being worth it to put her on a hard sell. I like the idea of, Partnering like her with B2 rocket troopers too, just to kind of guarantee that raid. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, no, I think I think I think she's great. Uh she also doesn't have to get exhausted. There's no mm -hmm. token or command you have to spend. The only requirement is you gotta have a, a raid on there. And with the B2 rocket droids, it's really easy to put raid tokens. Yeah. Um, and with Dooku, it's even easier, right? So I guess you could use her on a salvo then too. Yeah, because it's after you perform an attack, right? So yeah, I hadn't thought about that. I think it's great. All the tokens, yeah. Uh, so John left us a couple notes. Pretty much everything we've talked about on the squadrons and uh, with Ven, uh, with Price, he would just mimic a lot of what we're saying. Um, the one thing he wanted to point out with Ventress, 
uh, is that he really believes that Asajj is highly underrated. Uh, that And he agrees that it's not a gain a token officer because it doesn't matter the token you gain. It's more that you are denying uh, the person. So he, again, he's agreeing, but uh, expressing the amount of underratedness that people I think are throwing into Asajj. I think Asajj in the right hands is more powerful than Price. Price just changes the die, which you can use to trigger you know, a special crit. But Asajj can really take away um, what you're trying to do. Yeah. Just take it away. So, uh, but yeah, we so that's that. Um, we got admirals left, right? <laughs> admirals. Well, one general, uh -huh. I guess. Two generals. Two generals. Uh -huh. General Skywalker, General Draven. Who's going? Who wants to take Draven? I I'll don't... take Draven. Yeah, please. Um, so we got General Draven, who. Uh, I guess they figured he wasn't getting enough use in the officer slot, so they made him a, a commander. Um, you get um, two dials, and you two, choose two dot command dials for the card, uh, and, you, and you place them on your, on your card. And at the start of each ship phase, you may reveal and discard one command dial. If you do, until the end of the round, when an enemy ship spends a matching command dial... It resolves that dial as though it spent a token of the same type instead. It, is a, it was uh, very clearly uh, written there. Um, no issues. So um, basically, as it, as it works out, um, as if is the most important thing. So just pretend that when you're resolving your dial, you have a token. Um, you know, it's, a, it's an imaginary token. It's not, it doesn't break the two token rule. It's not so you don't literally have two tokens. You just have an imaginary token effect and then another token. So if you have two squad token, if you have a squad dial um, and a squad token and someone Draven's you essentially is what I'm going to say, you get to you only get to do two squads um, is kind of how it works. It's 28 points. Um, I think it's I don't think it's playable. I think it's a really bad card. Uh, I, I just don't see it mixing it up. Um, a bad card from, I just don't think it's uh, going to be competitive. I could be wrong, but I, I just don't see it. Yeah, he's not cheap enough to be like a, I have a budget fleet to just throw on. He's not 20 points. And I don't think two turns is enough to really impact how a, how a fleet battle will go. I, yeah, I don't know. And, you, and you have to know which, you know, and it's and there's some skill in knowing which, you know, which command to choose. Now, obviously, if you're going against a commanded squad fleet, you chose you choose squads. Squadrons. But you know, five times out of ten, you may not be. You're probably not doing that. And yeah. so you you have to know at the start of the game which, uh, you know, which command you only want them getting a, a token out of. So it it's hard. So I think Draven is a commander that a more experienced player is going to figure out first because of the level of difficulty in terms of determining what you have. Uh, I think there is one thing going for Draven, and that is unlike every other commander, where when you deploy that ship with the commander on it, that's when you assign what dials or tokens or whatnot go with the commander. So like, for example, with Thrawn, you place your three dials. They have to be selected when the ship he's on is deployed. Draven waits until all fleets have been, all ships and fle the fleets are deployed. Then he chooses his two dials. So you get a little bit of an idea of where all the ships are going to be and what the opponent could potentially be doing before you, you put Draven in. Now, we touched on this a little bit. 28 points. You get this for two turns and you don't necessarily do a lot because you have uh, a, a dial effect, which becomes a token, and then you can still spend the token because you're spending a dial and a token and just getting two token effects. For two turns, I, I agree. He's got to be a budget commander, like 20 to 24 points tops. I don't even think I'd take him for 24, 20 maybe. Alternatively, for 28 points, personal opinion, this is not the way he's played, but I think it would almost work better if you uh, reveal a command dial that is identical to uh, the one that Draven showed up, then it has to either, you can take it as a token or you can spend it to get rid of Raid. I think that would work better. That's not how the rules are written. That makes more sense to me at 28 points. Uh, the other thing you could do at 28 points, this has to be more than two turns. 
uh, because just two turns isn't enough to kind of reduce the effect of what you're doing. That's my opinion, though. Um, Do I think I'll pull him out? I'll try him. But I don't think he has enough oomph to really make a a difference, Uh, especially if you're going up against, I mean, a con fire fleet. Instead of adding a dial, you get to re-roll two. Okay, maybe you're just going to use the dial to re-roll one die and then you keep your token. Um, You're not having enough of an effect on your opposing player. Uh, With engineering points, that could hurt if you're up against something uh, like, for example, uh, uh, an interdictor. So instead of getting five and three, instead of getting eight, you're going to get six. But you still get six points as opposed to eight. I mean, it you know, your difference is adding one more shield. So 20 points is too much. So the effect either needs to be stronger, which I know some people complain about because, oh, but then he's too strong and he, you know, he hurts what you're doing. But okay, if you know you're going up against Draven, and let's just assume that the way I'm thinking it should have worked is how it was written. Okay, you've got a squadron fleet. You know that he's going to have two squadron dials built in there. And then you can maybe try and get him, him being Draven, to reveal that dial, and you wait another turn. Um, or you do your alpha strike on turn one instead of turn two. I, there, there are ways to combat it either way. Um, it'll just kind of ruin your plans a little bit for part of a turn. Um, and you can always just take it as a token and then still use it. For some commanders, that's great, because then you get uh, a token, which is going to be better for you anyways. Um, trench, you don't need the dial, you want the token. Um, you will neuter a little bit of what Trench can do because you're not getting the full effect. But still, um, you know, it, it's one of those, as it's currently ruled, it's it's tough. I, I also question if you're allowed, well, you can because AMG says you can, but if you read the rule book, there's no real precedent for resolving two token effects. That That in my brain doesn't sit right, but that's me. Not, I don't know. I, it makes sense to me. I, I, I don't, I, I, it, the, the two token effects makes, makes sense to me, but uh, to your point, I, I kind of feel like he's Emperor Palpatine, uh, Admiral no, Commander, he, very difficult to use, you know, maybe you can, you know, the stars will align with Emperor Palpatine or Draven and you just, you get everything right. You, you nuke their dials and they, they can't navigate or they can't squad. But it just seems very difficult to use and very overpriced. We did get a Palpatine fleet, though, uh, at uh, Adepticon that did fairly well, if I recall correctly. So, hey, you never know. Maybe uh, come Worlds next year, Draven will be in top 10. Maybe. So. Maybe. I don't know. We'll see. He's just a soggy ball of cornflakes. <laughs> <laughs> how many you start? How many? How many is that, Garrett, on your rating system? A soggy Draven? ball? Draven? I don't know. Like, What's a soggy ball of cornflakes? He's, I don't know. He's like a. Four out of ten. I, I could just not care less that this card exists. Yeah, yeah. Uh, he's just he's just there. I'm just like I, that's what I'm saying. Like this guy's going to the box of shame. He's going in there, he's gonna sit next to Garbo Elbless, and they're gonna hang out and talk about the glory days <laughs> of the '90s. <laughs> so, we go talk yeah. to his officer card and be like, "How you doing? No, you're not being used either, huh?" Oh. Keep them on the same page, right? So yeah. <laughs> oh, you're not doing any intel stuff. Oh, figures. Um. Yeah, so anyways, but yeah, so that's uh, that's General Draven. Super duper not awesome. Uh, But we have the star of the show last year. um, The cause of uh, much strife. Oh boy. uh, Looking looking smug as... Look at this art. Look how smug he looks. Look at him. Yeah. Uh, He's just letting you know that he's about to take you to town. Um, Anakin Skywalker. artist and knew what he was doing. Oh my gosh! Yeah. Uh, listen, Anakin Skywalker, he does exactly what you don't think he can do. He <laughs> is going to attack you at the front arc, and then he's going to attack you at the side arc. Then he's going to flip one of his solo tokens and attack you again. Then he's going to say, "Oh wait, DB wise, this is actually a black double." And then he's going to say, "All right, it's your turn." But I'm going to ram you some in the same spot, and you're going to shoot at him. And he's like, "Okay, I'm a salvo." And then you're going to say, "All oh, that hurt," and he's like, "Yeah, but I'm a salvo again." Uh, so, so let's maybe we should let's so potentially your personal right, play experience or your nightmare. So let's, which one yeah, so, let's talk about what he does. Yeah, well, that's what he does, right? He does five attacks, <laughs> yeah. uh, optimal, right? So you are allowed to make a salvo attack after an attack. Um, so you can do your normal attack at the front, right, or at the side, 
and then you can spend a solve token to do a solo attack out that arc. Uh, and then he's Anakin, and I didn't—I forgot to add the other part. He adds a die, right? Um, he can add a die to the solve attack. So if you're in pain bow range, blue, black, red, he can make it blue, red, black, black, uh, and then do that. Um, well, Garrett, you just need to be at medium range because if you've got flak guns, then you get the black dice anyways. Uh, yeah. So yeah. Um, so yeah. I mean, adds a die to Savo attacks, and every attack he makes, or not every attack. Sorry. Once uh, per activation, which is another key part of this card, right? Once per activation. So not just your activation, another ship's activation. Uh, you get to perform an attack, a Savo attack after you perform an attack. So. Uh, I don't know. I feel like I might be being unclear here, but uh, as far as balance goes, I think it's way too much. Uh, I don't think. So before we get into balance, just sure. to, to well, clarify what? kind of how he works. One the one of the rule, the main rule that we didn't understand when the card was released and how he worked was on uh when, on a on a defensive attack a salvo, but basically right. when he's being attacked by someone else. Did the card read you just get the salvo and then that was it? Or do you get the salvo and get again by spending another salvo token? So essentially you get two attacks on a, on a, two salvo attacks on one shot. Um, and they came out and said, yep, that is how it works. So that's right. where the five attack part comes in uh, with Anakin. You get your your two two normal attacks, right? You get a third one with the, with the salvo. Because it's because it's what once uh, once per activation once per activation, once per activation. Right? so and then you get, can get attacked again by someone else and that's another two salvos so that's that's where the five attacks is coming from and I think the the the, the defensive salvo double double defensive salvo is what is especially painful and uh, jarring I think for a lot of the, the community right because well, not only is it double double defensive but he's adding a die both times right. Right. So if you're at close range, that's eight dice. And if he's got DBYs, that's four guaranteed damage. Uh, Because he could change that black die to a crit, hit crit. So uh, So when when you consider what Anakin's probably going to do, Anakin's up on, usually you're going to throw him on a Venator. So there's there's your four damage, assuming you could potentially get that off with DBYs, right? Even if you don't have DBYs, theoretically, you could still do four damage. Yep. Ordinarily, you would do one, two, three, four. Well, ordinarily, you do four. So actually, you could potentially do six with Anakin, right? Because mm-hmm. you're throwing in a, a well, anyway, it's three dice. So one, two. Yeah. Well, four. you can get four. Throw in another black, you could do six. Right. So, all right. So you go from four to six possible. And then you get to do it a second time. So you go from, uh, you know, four uh, to eight or even possibly 12 damage doing this. So, in a way, doing that double salvo is like getting three sal- normal salvos in two shots. Um, that's a lot. Um, not to mention, you make your front arc, you make your side arc, and one of those two, you could also then do another six potential points of damage. That's a lot of firepower coming out of one ship. I think just adding the one die alone is such a force multiplier for every one of your salvo attacks. It's it's really mean, uh, and for twenty nine points, my opinion that's undercosted. Um, he should be up in the thirty eight points, like Akbar, uh, if not more. Um, I've played him two ways before uh, this came out. Uh, the the rulings and updates and clarifications. I played him the you could triple tap, so your shot shot Anna Salvo, and then you can uh, Salvo and Anna Salvo defensively. Uh, so worth noting, those five attacks are assuming one person shoots you. Uh, if you have a second shot, then it's a different activation. You get to do that again, assuming you have a number of uh, defensive tokens available to do that with Salvo. If you do all that, that's a lot of damage with the extra dice being thrown in there. So just even on the triple tap and double Salvo, that's three extra dice. So there, there's an extra attack in normal attack uh, based off Salvo. If you make the the situation where you fire and then you can choose to follow it up with a salvo and that's your second shot, and then you don't get to double salvo, that's still a lot of firepower 
because you're firing and hitting the exact same shot. It makes it a better advanced or a gunnery teams type ship. Because with gunnery teams, you can fire once and then you can fire out the same hull zone, but you have to hit a different target. So this effectively allows you to hit the target and hit again, kind of like advanced gunnery uh, if you're second player. That's, I think, a little bit more in effect closer to what a 29 point commander would do because that burns through one area very fast. Uh, but that, that again, my opinion, that's not how the card works. Um, well, we're, we're dancing around it. So let's, let's get to it. Is he broken? Oh uh, yeah. I mean, no questions. I think there's <laughs> room for correction here um, uh, as far as a game balance. Uh, thing. Cause like, it's not just one ship, right? It's a whole fleet. Yeah, that, that's every ship the thing. Like, it's every single ship. If it was just the flagship, then eh, okay, maybe. Yeah. Um, and, and that's, I, I think maybe we will see a clarification going on. It's not unheard of. Um, and, you know, you throw a card out in the wild and people realize, oh, here's some stuff that you can do with it that no one thought of during play testing. Right. And maybe after a while, they're like, okay, yeah, we need to tone this down. Uh, case in point, let's assume for the moment uh, a Magic Gen Con tournament occurs and all 32 players are bringing Anakin. Atomic Mass Games is going to have to do something. <laughs> so, right. I mean, I'll that. say this. Like, I think we're we're kind of having, at least in my mind, two different conversations in terms of like, I think, is he broken? I think for casual play, it's a bad experience, I think. Oh, one hundred percent. If you're gonna, if you so, don't don't bring this to someone you're trying to get to play the game for the first time. I, I think he's he's a bad experience. Let them bring it if they want. Yeah, uh, actually, that's that's not a bad idea. Anakin is a great beginner Armada player card. Right, it's pretty yeah. easy to understand ability. Just start flipping salvo tokens. So I think casually, I, I do. In in the in in the casual setting, I think Anakin is broken. I think he's probably unfun for for like more casual players. But you know, we generally talk about you know the competitive scene, and and I don't think he's broken in the competitive scene. But I do think, you know, we're talking about the the Steel Strategy podcast used to have this you know the rankings of commanders, and Omega tier was the highest tier. Um, I don't know why. Omega was, but it's they chose Omega. Players, that's why for the highest tier. And so, like, there was very few things that were ever in Omega tier. One of them was like the original Riken, where like everything could die in your fleet in one turn, but you still get the they still all could could save, right? Like that was a bad experience. And so, I think we're really having the conversation of is this Omega tier or is this S tier? Is this something kind of below it? I am, I am not yet convinced it's Omega tier. I, I think it's. I think it's definitely S tier. I think it's very good at the competitive scene. Okay. So like, you know, at, at worlds, I looked at the top eight, uh, fleets. I think all of them, except for actually, strangely enough, the, the, the winner, um, you know, James's fleet could handle it. I think James's fleet would have a lot of trouble with, with an Anakin fleet. Um, but I think he's got his holes and, you know, one of them is he's got his vulnerabilities. Um, I don't think like an all ship Anakin is viable in the competitive scene. I'll say that mm -hmm. most of the top eight fleets had over 70 points of squads at, at worlds. Anakin str will, will struggle with um, heavy squad presence, which just happens to be the most popular archetype on the competitive scene. I think because um, if you're not taking Anakin uh, squadron, Republic squads are bad. Like people, people tried to make Republic squads work for a long time before Anakin squad. And they just, they really largely had a lot of trouble with that. And they, and he unlocked them. Now, if you take Anakin commander, Republic squads are bad again. And that's, you know, in a combined arm game, combined arm game, arms game, um, you know, that, that matters. Um, but I'm, but I'm, I think it's a, you know, he's a very aggressively priced. Um, I'm not ready to say, you know, he's he's broken or anything like that but uh, um i think he's got counters definitely in the competitive scene but i but i do sympathize with with a newer player who's going to be playing against anakin yeah. i don't um, know i think anakin with a light squad screen just to delay right because anakin can power he, he speed runs ship attacks right so instead of waiting two to three turns he can drill through a ship and then if he has one backup ship with him, right, and he can easily take out smalls, right? Smalls are dead if he gets them in range. 
And then a medium, he can crush a medium. And a large, if he has two ships with him, a large is going to go down in two turns. Um, and I think that's really fast to hope your squadrons can take down everything. But we don't know yet, right? We don't have the data in. We don't have the competitive uh, results back. Um, I mean, me two turns to take down a Venator is not, is not unheard of. You it's know? not. Like, it, it's... it's <laughs> It's definitely not like they're they're not the toughest ships in the world, and now they're going to be flying like bricks. They're going to be a very predictable flying pattern. I agree with you on CR nineties. Yeah, I think CR ninety swarms, and I know like three of the top eight had were CR ninety four swarms, but they all had one thirty four rogues. Like I think CR ninety swarms are a problem, but you know what? I didn't really enjoy flying against CR ninety swarms, so yeah. I'm not going to be too upset if I if I don't have to play another CR ninety swarm. But I'm. I will agree. It is too early to really say one way or the other. Uh, I've only had Anakin on the board twice now, uh, and and both uh, both times were negative experience. Uh, and I would personally rather go up against a double onager list. Uh, that's me. Um, I, I think he needs to be played more against different commanders, and I want to see how it works out. Um, now, you you pointed out that a lot of the top eight fleets from Worlds would probably actually be able to deal with it, but how many of the top eight fleets? were Imperial onager lists that could blow stuff up across the table that a salvo won't work with. Um, yeah, there were, th- there were three, at least three onager fleets in the top eight. So but I I, I'd be curious to see uh, how that works out. I, I Again, I don't know. I haven't had a chance to really play that one out. I'm not necessarily against this. I think it something needs to be changed, though, whether that's a points increase to Anakin or it's limited to just his flagship or something because uh, as he stands he has to be the first ship you want to take out as the opponent because then that destroys quite a bit of the remaining firepower of the fleet yeah uh, it, it's akin to taking Madi out where all of a sudden your ships are one two three more hull points and now all of a sudden it's gone uh that's kind of essentially what you need to do here with anakin um I, again, limited time on the table. I kind of waited. Well, I got him on the table before uh, the, the rulings were put out and I haven't played with him since. So something I have to play with, but I, I'm willing to agree. You might be right, Ryan, uh, that uh, I, one thing I didn't think about, yeah, ship power, he can destroy stuff quick. But if you've got a squadron heavy fleet, uh, you might be able to do a lot of damage because frankly, Anakin's not doing very much there. Uh, he could salvo them, and add an extra die to attack a squadron. But that's limiting as opposed to shooting at a ship. So, yeah. Uh, I'll say this, like if, if we're, we're, we keep talking, bringing up the five attacks and everyone on the discords and Facebook talks about the five attacks. I never see anyone say this. If like, if you do the five attacks, you only have one red exhausted salvo token left. So you're, so it's just not going to happen again. You know, like you're never, you get that one shot to do your five attacks, and and that will put out a lot of damage. It'll nuke a, it'll nuke a small, but that's it. That that ship you can attack that ship again with impunity for for the most part without getting salvo back. Yeah, I, I will have the means to do so. I do like that. Yeah. You might not have the means to do so after that. Yeah, uh, yeah, and you can tech against you can tech against Anakin. Uh, there's things to, you know, obviously Sloan is a big tech against him. Uh, but I will say, even just the three attacks by itself is pr- with the extra die is pretty big. Um, no doubt. Because then there's no, no risk to you, especially if you're local fire control, right? You get four, your four attacks every turn consistent, uh, which I think is, that's how I played them in the games I did play them with. I didn't do a double attack and defense. And it was, I mean, it was great. Uh, I feeling as the player being Anakin. Uh, but, uh, yeah, I don't, again, I think we need more data, but I do think it's going to be a bit much. As and he far might as be negative he might plays be Omega tier, right? Like he, he might yeah. be Omega tier. That, that, that certainly could be the case. Um, he's definitely S tier in my mind. Um, oh yeah. I mean, he is him and Bail Organa. He, he, he goes above Bail. But they're both S tier. But I don't know. It's you know, either take Bail with Anakin and the Delta, or you take Anakin and then maybe it Anakin with matchstick and a bomber ball. 
Here's where yeah, my concern I, fits. If you take a look at a Venator one, Brand, you have to get close. You fire out the front and you've got three reds, three blacks. We're just going to assume that you're at close range. Then you fire out the side with a red, a blue, and two black dice. And then you can do your Anna Salvo and you get a red, a blue, a black, and you get to add one. So it'll probably be another black die. So now you are basically making the equivalent of two side shots because of the extra added die with Anakin and then that that front shot. If you go off of N2, it's pretty much the exact same thing, except your side shots, two reds, two blues, and then you're going to fire with the red, blue, and double black. Uh, so it, it's a lot of extra firepower. It's effectively give you another side shot. Uh, and that's a lot. <laughs> there's there's no doubt. On there and yeah. that's, that's even more. So um, it's about your expectations. I, I, I think as a, as you know, as your player, like if I'm going, and I think where it could be, it could be an issue is if we do ever start having store championships, um, you, you get a lot of casual players at store championships. And I think mm-hmm. that could be a real turn off because people are trying to win those store championships, right? It's this weird mix of casual and super competitive because there's a world sticking. Right. You've added stakes, really yeah. important stakes. Yeah. And, and I think that could be um, a bad experience for a lot of players if they're not ready for it, for sure. So I, I, I definitely don't want to see like I'm downplaying him because I, I, I don't think it's just like the end of Armada. And that yeah. Oh, I think it's important. I think your counterpoints are very good and important. You know, Venators, you know, when you think about what ships are going on it, you're it's either a Venator or an Acclimator. Um, and I like I like it on him on like an implacable Acclimator. But you're really talking about two Venators, probably, in most fleets. And that's it, right? Like, if you want any kind of a squad presence, you know, you're going to bring be bringing a counselor. Um, maybe you bring a Pelted with projection experts, but then you have a smaller squad ball. So you're talking three ships. You're going to be out activated against most um, against most fleets. So like it has its vulnerabilities, but you can't mess up. And and I guess that's it. Like you can't you can't get into medium range, double armed you know, as an MC thirty. You're dead. You know there's nothing there's nothing to do about. It. So I, I I get that for sure. He's definitely I think the best rebel or republic admiral, without a doubt. Yeah. I I think he's also I mean two venators both thermals um and Anakin can chase down an onager eat it in one turn and then chase the other one so I think it's a good anti onager list I, I do think thermals are going to be a lot more prevalent for a little while because that's going to be your best way to knock down some of the Anakin dice right so. uh, I think you're, you're going to see a lot. A lot of overload pulse is always the don't leave home without it. The, and there was an interesting rules interaction that I only learned because looking at the Discord with overload pulse, where if they want to do the double salvo off of an overload pulse, they're they're spending one. They don't get to spend um a, a salvo with an overload pulse. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Um, it, it's already red, so you got to chuck it if you want to use yeah. it. Right. So you don't get the double use of this album, which is something, right? It's not everything. It's something. I think, right. I do think you got to go first player. I don't think you can let, um, if you want to have a chance, I don't think you can let Anakin be first player. Um, I think that's. I better. 100% agree with you there. Um, the two, two times I've dealt with Anakin, first player Anakin will win. Yeah. Um, and a second player Anakin can but it needs to go against something that is not going to be able to maintain itself against the damage. So it's half and half. Uh, but nonetheless, again, I'm willing to wait and see how things go. I want to get them to the table more. I think we said the same thing about Onagers for a while, that they were horrible for the game and everything else. Um, by the same token, there are ways around it, um, yeah. as was clearly shown at Worlds. I still think they're a little undercosted, but that's... Me, I, I, we're, we're still waiting on that points adjustment for Honikers. Um, I'd like to see a couple different points adjustments, you know, victories because I love victories, yeah. Uh, but you know, that's neither here nor there. I, I honestly, my only real concern with Anakin is it's partially the double salvo, but it's it's the fact that you're you're firing three three times in your activation, and that's like one of the core things with Armada is you get to fire twice, so but that. That's me. 
That is nothing else to do. I understand upgrade cards are supposed to break that. But if he wasn't adding an extra die, I think that would be better. If he wasn't, it was only effective on his flagship, that would be better. Um, that, that's anyway. I've, I yeah, just have I'm one more, more observation. Um, like, I don't think we're going to see, I just don't think we're the community of like, this kind of homogeneous community of like everyone's gonna gonna play Anakin. I, I think I think people like just to take different stuff to be different. Um mm -hmm. like we really haven't seen homogeneity in fleets since um like price two ship. Uh, and I do think back then like I think the Gen Con was like virtually every Imperial was flying, you know, price two ship. Like it was a lot. And and you would look at regionals and how they were doing it was like that was a dominant archetype. Right. I just think there's so many different things that are good in the game in terms of like things that not to exploit, but things that are competitive that I just don't think you're going to see one archetype uh, dominate again. Cause I think there's just too many cards, too many ships, you know, um, I may be wrong on that. Maybe we'll see some old cards come out of the binder and uh, get used again. Overload yep. pulse. Uh, Board, boarding the, troopers, uh, that uh, card. Boarding troopers is always a good card to bring out, right? So, I mean, that's troopers. what he did against me in our game with Anakin, right? He overload pulsed me and then boarding troopered me off a of Kuat. Yeah, my so, mistake was going speed zero with Corvus. So, yeah, yeah, I didn't but, play uh, that. Yeah, Anakin, Anakin, Anakin. Uh, so yeah, it's gonna be some drama still. Uh, I'm sure we'll be talking about it for a while. I think yes. the next, so we've got. I'm interested to see how the Texas Open shakes out. I think mm -hmm. uh, Mercier said they're looking at up to 25 plus players. And then we got the Stampede Open in June, which is the Canadian. Um, they're going to have another good test pool of players. Uh, I'm not sure when the next European thing is. I know the, the Polish polls are always doing something. Uh, but we should have more concrete data coming in. Probably yeah. by the time the next podcast. So we'll yeah. be able to say like, hey, Anakin sucks. Everyone was wrong. <laughs> I, I might, I might totally change my tune and be like, "You got to ban him. <laughs> you got to get rid of him." Yeah, or he, or it's like, what is it? The last first edition X Wing Worlds, where it was like two fleet, two squadrons to each other, where neither one could win or something. Like they both could heal on the same turn or something. It was just yeah. an infinite loop. I don't know. So, but this is just gonna be infinite mutual destruction again, which is what happened at our worlds, but more from random chance, but. <laughs> Definitely, uh, definitely, and to kind of wrap it up. This is the meta shakeup, right? And it gets if you if you want to play competitive armada and you're not planning on him, you know, addressing it through upgrades or changing the way you're flying or objectives. What are you doing? You know, like yeah, you're gonna have bad thoughts. Time. You plan for it. No, I'd agree. I'd agree. So, well, let's see how the meta shakes up. It'll be interesting. Long road to worlds. Yeah, let us know what you think. Uh, if you're watching on YouTube in the comments, be interested to see what y'all say. Uh, but yeah, so that's that for that. You guys want to talk about what else are we playing? Oh, uh, Ryan's favorite segment. Yeah. Um, unfortunately, um, I haven't been playing anything, and I'll tell you why. Because I was, I, I had, I have at least a thousand hours in Hearts of Iron Four. Okay, and so I tried <laughs> to fire it up again. It's just this World War II grand strategy game by Paradox. It's a sandbox. Wonderful game, right? At least a thousand hours, but I haven't played it in 18 months, at least. And so I tried to fire it up. I'm like, you know what? I want to play Romania. I want to, you know, I want to just take over the Balkans and have a greater Romania. Couldn't do it. I, I forgot how to play the game. Um, it is so complicated. And if like, you just, it's not something you can restart and, and come back to. So I was incredible. I spent two hours trying to change the color of the map i was looking <laughs> at youtube videos couldn't get it it yeah. was very disappointing i was like it's a great game but i couldn't i couldn't come back to it so no i, I haven't been playing that's why because it's super complicated yeah paradox games are what content bloat i try to play stellar sometimes and i just get overwhelmed by the menus i'm like well maybe later and then you know years pass what about you, Ken? What else have you been playing? Uh, I've been playing a couple of games. So uh, the new Legend of Zelda game came out. 
uh, Tears of the Kingdom, so I started playing that. Nice. Uh, I have to uh, fight with my wife and son to be able to get the uh, Switch to be able to get a little bit of time on that. Is it as good as everyone says? I'm not far enough in it to to really make an opinion. Now, my personal opinion, I like Breath of the Wild more. I'm also only like one temple into it. Uh, and I'm noticing that the older I get, the less patience I have for <laughs> fiddliness. <laughs> video. Yeah, puzzle. So um, it's not the puzzles; it's the fiddliness with the control. Yeah, I get you. Um, okay, yeah. So I'll, I'll. There's that. Um, but that's that's neither here nor there. Uh, I've uh, pulled out some of the old Avalanche Press World War II games, so uh, Midway, uh, and I've been playing. Uh, so the uh, was it the, not the Great War at Sea, but the the Second Great War, I think, is the series that they have. Uh, so I've been playing uh, that a little bit recently. Uh, I have uh, also kind of, for whatever reason, started replaying Starfleet Battles a lot, which is not necessarily uncommon for me, but really having a kick uh, playing a game that's 44 years old. Uh, and of course, I've been playing Shatterpoint. Uh, so we did get a, a review copy over here and I painted it all up, got a couple pictures out already, uh, and I've had a couple of games of that. I'm actually really enjoying it. It's It's not bad uh rule book was a little difficult to get through until i got two playthroughs and then it makes more sense so it, there's some level of sub organization and a cheat sheet would be a really handy thing to have for it but uh nice. overall i i really enjoy the game yeah i'm just really curious about that i've been seeing it i guess i, don't, I say the word too much and so facebook and google have just been plastering me with like videos about sharepoint mm -hmm. all the painters and stuff and we're going to watch them too, Garrett. So I'm going to blast uh, more into that realm for you. Yeah, yeah. So Shatterpoint. So it's, uh, it's going to be interesting. Um, what else have I been playing? So I haven't been playing any board games. Fortunately, all my physical time has been spent making some tater gear for Armada. Uh, what did I play? Oh, Jedi Survivor on uh, the sequel to Fallen Order. Mm -hmm. so I played that. It's, uh, I will say, there's a lot of performance issues, like everybody says, uh, but the game is really fun. So uh, if you like lightsaber games, I highly recommend, obviously, the first one, Fallen Order, and then this newest one, Survivor. So Fallen Order was pretty good. I like that. Uh, yes. Survivor kind of follows the same trend. Same thing, and then adds much stuff. So all sorts of different lightsaber stances. You know, if you like Star Wars, you're going to enjoy it. Uh, I, it's like just a good, I, what is this? We joked about when Andor, the television series, came out. They're like, it's not just good. It's not just good Star Wars TV. It's good television in general. So <laughs> that's how I feel about these Survivor games. Is yeah, it's, it's not just a good Star Wars game. It's like actually good. So cool. Uh, yeah, if anybody's thinking about it, I'd say it's worth it, uh, especially on a console. I guess it runs better. Um, I don't have a lot of issues on my Xbox. So but I guess PC, it's another story. But I don't know, I'm not an expert there. So, uh, but yeah, so. Anything else, guys? Are we are we satisfied? Yeah, it we got we got new stuff in Armada. It was a good it was a good day. Yeah, it's actually kind of I oh, I was gonna say I don't. My prediction is this is pure speculation. I think we won't see a third rapid reinforcements. I think if we get more content, I think it'll be an actual product. In my personal, that would be tremendous. I'm, I'm inclined to agree with you. Yeah. Based on stuff I've heard, I, I think this is the rapid reinforcements, I believe, are stopgap measures to kind of, because we've gotten one a year about the same time. And it's been, here's a shakeup, here's a shakeup. And I, I, I just have this feeling like we're going to get something probably, we're going to probably start hearing about it around christmas time i think i yeah i think so i think there's no ships in this i think that was a big one and then all that stuff that will stick was talking about as far as like finding new places to make things manufacturing yeah. lead times as like that's a really random thing to talk about if you're not going to make something so yeah, i i think at that point you're also going to have enough of the new shatter point stuff out where you could then start moving some of the production to something else i do wonder if there isn't another wave of armada stuff that is being very well hidden that just surfaces and shows up. So we'll see. I'm very hopeful for it. Um, I, I think if nothing else, this has definitely breathed some new life into the game. 
um, you know, new ideas, new concepts that we get to figure out over the next year. Uh, and we'll probably see something before the next tournament season. So my guess is we'll get some kind of inkling at Worlds next year of what exactly is going to drop, but start hearing rumors of it beforehand. Yep. I agree. Well, cool, guys. Uh, what do you want to sign us off, Ken? I, I can sign us off. Why not? So uh, thank everyone for hanging out with us, uh, talking about all kinds of different stuff here, what we've been playing, rapid reinforcements to whether or not we think Anakin is truly broken or not. Uh, stay tuned to next podcast where we, we decide which one of us is horribly <laughs> wrong, which one's horribly right. Uh, and then John might be able to voice his opinions. Again, we have to see if we can't get him away from those pesky Ewoks because they're hopefully they don't eat him up or something He's like gone. that. We'll Let see. it go. Let him go. We'll, we'll just have to bring a clone. We'll start calling John, right? So, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, until next time, everyone, I'm Ken. I'm Garrett. And I'm Ryan. And you've been listening to Command Stack. <laughs>